Welcome to this Day One Conversation. I'm here with Krista Tippett, the host and producer of Krista Tippett on Being, the American public media program based in Minneapolis. Chris is the author of two books, Speaking of Faith and Einstein's God. Krista, thanks for talking with us. Happy to talk to you. You earned a degree in history from Brown University and studied politics in Cold War Europe on a Fulbright scholarship. You worked at, as a New York Times uh, stringer and freelancer for Newsweek and the BBC and several other media in a divided Berlin, Germany. You even served as a special assistant to the ambassador to West Germany. It sounds so glamorous. <laughs> And, but those experiences in that divided country at that time must have had an effect on you. What happened? They did. I, you know, glamour always looks more glamorous on the outside. <laughs> and I was in my 20s, and I, I was very fortunate. And I think I also look back and realize how lucky I was to have those experiences. But at the time, I was 25, and I was just <laughs> making a living and having my adventures. Um, but they did. It did form me. It formed me in ways that I didn't expect. I was I was pretty ambitious, and I was mm -hmm. also idealistic. I really was drawn to Germany as this place where, which was a microcosm of the big divisions of the world mm. at that time. I used to say, you know, we're we're straddling the fault line that divides the world. And um, but in those years, and then I, I I was fortunate to work at pretty high levels of policy eventually. Mm -hmm. And I, came, I became really disenchanted with, I would say, the way we defined the issues and the, the way we thought about solutions, uh, political solutions and strategic solutions and military solutions, mm -hmm. which is the world I inhabited there, um, ultimately s seemed to me to be falling short of human reality. And, and that was that, that kind of eventually led me to start thinking religiously again and then get a theological education. I really wanted to puzzle over that, figure out what that meant. Well, you left Germany about a year before the wall mm -hmm. fell. Mm -hmm. Are you sorry you missed that? You know, I'm not. Um, it was an amazing day for me when the wall came down. Mm -hmm. But the years I was there were so interesting because there was a lot of movement under the surface and I saw it start and ferment and bubble. It was a really interesting time. There were all these connections, human connections being made across the wall. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 you know, it wasn't something that everybody f could see from afar. What was also really instructive to me about that experience in a big way is that um, I, I just realized after that that there's always more change possible than we can imagine mm -hmm. in any moment because even with all of that fluidity that it started no one and I, I really mean I, I really think no one in Germany including the Chancellor you know s still on November 9th 1989 thought the wall would actually come mm -hmm. down um, but it was very interesting to be there in that moment of flux mm -hmm. and then of course you know the city that Berlin became after that is a completely different city than right. the one I lived in <laughs> Say more, you mentioned um, being drawn to the study of theology after that experience. Um, you went to Yale, got an MDiv there. Mm -hmm. What? Say more about what drew you to that field. I hadn't been religious for about 10 years. And you had a I was raised family. Southern Baptist. I had a really religious upbringing. Mm -hmm. But I had kind of decided, I wouldn't say I was atheist, but I just kind of decided that religion was irrelevant. I mean... I don't remember knowing people who went to church or synagogue in those years. Maybe they did, but we didn't talk about mm. it. Um, I was talking to people all the time about political events or about nuclear arms negotiations. Um, religion never came into it. And I, I, did, I did tend to think about all the important things that I was working on as geopolitical and strategic and... You know, the word mm -hmm. theology was mm -hmm. not in there. But then when I started to think about these human dynamics that politics really didn't touch, mm -hmm. um, you know, those 
geopolitical negotiations were about life and death with a capital L and a capital D. Right. But I saw that there was still the human condition and people on the eastern side of the wall still uh, who had nothing, the way we defined it, you know, nothing with a capital N. Um, they carved out lives of incredible beauty and intimacy and integrity and hmm. people in the West who had everything um, didn't necessarily do that. That, that you know that this happened day to day, life to life, and somehow these great political realities mattered, but in some way they didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And I, so, all, eventually, I, I I started wanting to think to know what it would be to think about all that theologically, not just spiritually, but theologically. Um, I think it was also for me about. Uh, needing a contrast between the religion I'd grown up in, mm -hmm. which didn't enc encourage me to think in a complicated way about anything, really to ask questions. So I, I felt like if I was going to take religion seriously as a force in human life, if I was going to be religious, I needed to know that it could be about thinking as well as feeling. And also that uh, that I could take this kind of pondering about, well, here's what I've learned in Cold War Europe, uh, can theology speak to that? Hmm. I need. I needed to know that. So, where have you come in your own spiritual journey? What's your experience? Well, I definitely got a resounding yes to that question, uh, <laughs> and and in fact, it, it was the experience of being studying theology, you know, being introduced to this world of not just intellectual theological writing, but mm -hmm. You know, beautiful spiritual writing. It's you know, it's the Henry Nouwens as well mm. as the Dietrich Bonhoeffer's, um, Jean Vanier. I mean, learning about lives and communities and seeing a much bigger world of faith than I than I'd known before. Um, it was it was experiencing that that then you know when I got my MDiv and I came out into the world that I was very frustrated that how, at how invisible that was mm. in. Um, in a lot of the places where we look to be told the story of what's happening in the world, right? And and I had this background as a journalist, as a reporter. I was a big public radio listener, and this was nowhere to be found. Mm -hmm. So so that uh, you know that became kind of my the thing I became so passionate and determined about in a way that I can hardly even. You know, I mean, it was really hard. It was hard to make the case back then, but um, I just felt like it had to show somehow. Mm. It had to show up. So that led to the creation of Speaking of Faith mm -hmm. back in 2003. Mm -hmm. um, and it's evolved, of course. But what do you hope happens as part of that program? What do you hope happens in the audience? Honestly, I don't think about that. Mm -hmm. I, I care about it. I'm completely fed by it. But I don't feel like I have an agenda. I don't think we feel like we have an agenda. Like we're not doing particular programs to work a particular mm -hmm. effect. We're trying to create to find wise people whose voices may not otherwise be heard. You collect those yeah. voices. Yeah. Um, to draw out their depths, to you know, really try to probe what they might say that can add some mm -hmm. beauty to the world, that can be redemptive and life-giving. So I'd say we try to create hours of radio that are beautiful and uh, nourishing you know, edifying, all these words I like. Mm -hmm. So I don't think media, uh, so I, I, I would say, you know, I don't think those are necessarily words that a lot of media, at least secular media, would use to think about what they want their content to be, you know. But I think that's what we think about more, is we want to create something that has real integrity and beauty and meaning. And then we send that out into the world and and we let it do whatever it does. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, you know, quite magical. Now you, as you talk to so many people in so many fields, you get a, a good idea about what's going on in the country uh, in terms of cultural themes and issues. And, uh, but you also have a, a church experience. And I'm wondering if you have a sense of 
some of the important issues related to faith that the church will be wrestling with in a few years? Do you see mm -hmm. something on the horizon? Well, this doesn't really answer your question, but I, I, do, I do think a lot about how the church is changing because just like every institution is changing, that it's this moment of flux. And I, I don't think the church will disappear. I don't think Christianity will disappear. But I suspect that if we could look into some, you know, magic mirror that showed us what churches look like or what they do, how they're structured, what religious leadership looks like a hundred years from now, Christian leadership, I think it might, I think the forms might be really different. Mm -hmm. Um... So, I, you know, I'm kind of curious about that, and I, I, I think this is a painful time. Mm -hmm. And as I say, I don't think it's, 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 it's not, it's, it's a symptom of a larger, of kind of larger throes of change, and the pain is everywhere. Um, and, it, and it's partly so painful because we don't know what will replace it. Mm -hmm. But I do see people, re I see Christian leaders uh, and lay people really being searching about, uh, you know, how to be most faithful now, because that's kind of the only, right. and, you know, I see people going back, like digging deeper, going back to the essentials, because surely the forms that replace these that will endure and be meaningful will be built on those same mm -hmm. basics, right? And we can see how to the extent that our institutions are irrelevant, there's, you know, there, there are irrelevancies that, that are in their walls in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, that, that's something mm -hmm. I think about a lot, that, that big picture. I think, I, I, I do wish I could just for an hour kind of look a hundred years in the future. Right. But I, I do think about Bonhoeffer a lot. He's a really important theologian for me. And I, um, you know, he really was living in a time where the church had utterly betrayed its essence and um, where Christians had to um, articulate and embody their identities mm -hmm. kind of outside the walls of the institution, in, in the absence of, in spite of the institution. We're not in that extreme situation, but there are some corollaries. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of interesting and lovely ways that people are doing that. Now, you spoke to about 1,700 preachers at the, this year's Festival of Homiletics. And you spoke about listening, creating spaces uh, where we can have conversations that are meaningful. But I wonder if you would just kind of capsulize what you told those preachers. I think that listening is, is always a virtue, but listening again, in this context of a world that is changing mm -hmm. and changing at a pace where we don't even really get chances to just step back, take a breath, reflect. It's happening in real time. Um, that the virtue of listening becomes more necessary, and more urgent. It's also true that in a moment of, you know, change, which is very stressful for people, it's, it's frightening. Um, there's a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. And again, that creates a, a more urgent need for people who will listen, really listen, not just stop talking while the other person says what they have to <laughs> say <laughs> until they can say what they have to say. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, in this talk that I gave this morning, I quoted something I heard somebody else say last week that they'd learned that listening is a part of truth-telling. Mm -hmm thought that was really important. I mean, I think that's something I learn. And that the better we listen, uh, the, the, the more justice people can do to, to the complexity of truth. Um, listening, uh, you, have, you have to be kind of vulnerable to, to be listening, right? You mm -hmm. have to be ready to hear something that you weren't mm -hmm. prepared for. Um, Telling the truth is also a, something that makes us vulnerable. Um, vulnerability is something at the heart of uh, our humanity that, that our culture, that we don't know how to handle in this culture. 
but um, it's something that that our time forces us to to take seriously again. I was just talking to Walter Brueggemann about lamentations, right? Lamentations um, in the Bible are these moments of experiencing our vulnerability and the pain of that, but also then there's the normalcy of that. That's what we have to recover in this culture, hmm. that it's normal to be vulnerable over and over and over again. Um, and somehow I think... Uh, Listening becomes more of a of a virtue in these times of vulnerability where the answers are not clear and maybe the best we have to give each other are better questions. Hmm. Krista, thanks for talking with us. It's been a joy to listen to you. And please keep doing what you're doing. We need you. Well, thank you. And as you know, you've been a friend and a mentor to me on this journey. <laughs> so you have. Well. I appreciate that. You're the best. Thank you. Hmm.